service. I'm so excited to be able to join us this evening for service. How have you been? I trust that all is well with you and yours. We are still expecting. Packed <laughs> And some of our expectations are already coming to pass. There are testimonies that we'll be receiving throughout this year. It has been amazing. But don't stop expecting. Don't stop expecting. If I get greedy this year, get greedy. There's nothing God cannot do. We are the ones that limit our expectations. We are the ones that limit the things that we can get from Him. He is an ocean that can never run dry. Never forget that. So be greedy with your expectation. Increase your hopes. Increase your desires. I mean, God, anything you can dream of. What the Bible says, is it anything you can imagine that God will not do it? The Bible tells me that God will exceed it. Isn't that amazing? Hallelujah. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit this evening to teach us his word simply. Simply this evening, simply for the transformation of our mind. Sweet Spirit of the Most High God, I call on you this evening. Open your word to us. Let it come simple, precise, concise this evening in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Glory be to God. There's a popular story we know in the Bible. In fact, it is categorized as Jesus' first miracle. The miracle at the wedding of Cana. See, there's something about wedding and relationships that mean a lot to God. I was telling somebody the other day that everything God does, that the way God relates with people and with us and with nations is true in marriage. That is why Weddings are important. And you find this story in the book of John, chapter 2. The book of John, chapter 2. The Bible says something there. I'm reading from the New King James Version. That when they get, got to Cana, that the mother of Jesus was there. And a lot of other people were invited to that wedding, both Jesus and his disciples. And they got to a point in that ceremony that they ran out of wine. And something remarkable happened. The mother, Jesus' mother, went to him and said, Hey, these guys have run out of wine in verse 3. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? He said, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? And she did not respond to him. Isn't that remarkable? Mary said nothing to him. Mary left him and went to the servants at the occasion. And she said something to them. The Bible says that Mary went to the servants and said to them, Do whatsoever he tells you to do. Isn't that amazing that Mary did not say anything to his son? <laughs> she just went to the servants. Do whatsoever he tells you to, to do. Jesus did not tell Mary that he was going to do something. In fact, he told Mary, when we read some translations, that his time, his time for manifestation, the time to show his glory has not yet come. So he was like somewhat saying he's not going to do anything because it is not yet time. And yet, the woman left his presence, went to the servant. Anything Jesus tells you to do, do it. And she left. What does that show you? It shows you something about Mary. And it's sad that this has not been preached as much as it should be preached. It showed you that Mary, apart from knowing something, having a glimpse, an insight, into whom Jesus is, he showed that Mary had faith in Jesus' ability. <laughs> she had so much faith in Jesus' ability, even when she was turned down, she had faith enough to know that Jesus will turn up. Oh, oh, 
That sounds good. I like that rhyme. <laughs> I'm, going to get, I'm going to say that again. Glory be to God. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit. Even when Mary was turned down, she had enough faith to know that Jesus will turn up. Listen to me. May Jesus turn up in your life this year in an expected way and in an unexpected way. Oh, you're yeah, not listening to me. May Jesus do the things that you trust him to do and may he do the things that is far above what you have ever trusted him to do in your life. Oh, if you believe that, shout a big amen. <laughs> Type it in the comment section now. Say, the Lord will do. Say, I expect Jesus to do for me and my household far, far more than I have expected of him. God is going to do the unexpected in your life this year in the name of Jesus. And when I was brooding on this, I realized there was another woman that broke protocol in the Bible. There's something about women. There's a power and influence that women have over men and over God. If you're a man, you might squeeze your face, but that's the truth. A woman on her own decided how she will be healed, chose the method she's going to get that healing, and she set out on, on that quest. Do you know what happened? Without Jesus authorizing the anointing to leave him to her, that woman got her miracle. And here again, you're saying that woman, in the case here, is different because Jesus told him, his mom, it is not yet time for me to showcase my glory. And a woman went behind him, walked by faith, and guess what? Jesus turned up. Jesus showed up. And Jesus told the servants, <laughs> get pictures. Get um, in verse... Verse 6, get water pots, get pitchers, and pour water into the water pots. Then from the water pots, pour water into the pitchers. The pitchers are like jugs. You know those jugs that you pour water and juice or wine in, and you use it to distribute into glasses. And he told the servants, take the pitcher, take the jug, and serve the people. But first, they took it to the chairman of the ceremony. He had called the governor. I've heard people preach from this scripture and they said it was the governor of the city. No, it's not the governor of the city. It's the chairman of the occasion. And guess what? The governor of the feast, the chairman of the occasion, drank the wine. I was amazed. I said to the groom, ah, the normal thing to do now is to serve the best one at the beginning. When people are drunk, so drunk, that they cannot tell the difference, you now bring the cheap wine. How come you saved the best for last? Listen to me. God is saving the best for you this year. God is saving the best for your family this year. He's going to change that circumstance, that situation, that problem, that challenge, that disease, that lack that has persisted in your family. He's changing it this year. If you trust him, if you expect it, if you believe it, so it will be unto you in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, shout a big amen. Say, so, Pastor, I am making myself a target for this word. I am identifying with this prophecy. I am holding on to it this year. And it will surely come to pass as you have said it. Oh, and I say to you, go and prosper, son. Go and prosper, daughter. Be it unto you according to your expectation. Be it unto you according to your faith. Be it unto you according to your desires in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, this year of expectation. There's a scripture I must show you. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 from the New King James Version. Verse 12. The Bible says, Rejoicing in hope, Patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Rejoicing in hope. Patient 
in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. When you are hoping for something, when you are expecting something from God, the Bible says rejoice, make merry, be glad. Why? You know for certain that your expectation will not be cut off. Because you know that God is well able to fulfill his word on your behalf, you rejoice. This is what I call giving thanks before you get the miracle. It's an amazing, it is, it, is, it, is, it is a work of faith. At times that challenge might be so pressing that you, you lose your joy, that you lose your peace. You lose your joy, you lose your peace. And Satan intends for you to lose your joy. Satan intends for you to lose your peace because he knows that when you have peace and you are in peace, he knows that when you rejoice, despite the opposition, despite the trial, despite the diagnosis from the doctor, he knows that when you're in joy, in the midst of fear, when you are thanking God, despite the opposition and persecution, you automatically take the power of, of that trial. You take the ability of that tribulation to affect you. You diffuse the bomb. Ha! See, 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 see. When you give thanks in the place of trial, you diffuse the bomb. The bomb that was set to blow up to blow your career up, to blow your, 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 your family up, to blow your relationships, to blow your health up. When you praise God in the midst of that storm, when you thank God in the midst of that challenge, you diffuse the bomb. Oh, I, li I like watching all those movies, you know, where you know, FBI agents are trying to diffuse a bomb. That's one I saw uh, recently. And the guy was like, I'm not skilled. I don't know what to do. Then I had to call a bomb expert. And the bomb expert was like, they're so putting him through. Or which wire to cut. And you know the tension. They will wait until the clock runs down to 0 0.01. And they will cut. <laughs> and they will cut the wire. Hey, I'm, I'm telling you today, you don't need to run down the time clock. <laughs> Step into praise today. As you're listening to me, be gearing up to praise God. <laughs> As you're listening to me, be prepared to give Him thanks. <laughs> Diffuse that bomb with your thanksgiving. Diffuse that bomb with your praise. As the sooner you do it, the sooner you get reprieve. Rejoicing in hope. I'm going to read, read it in the Passion Translation. I'm going to read this in three translations today. This is the second one. It says, let this hope burst forth within you, releasing a continual joy. <laughs> May your joy know no bounds. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, let it let, let release continual joy. And be like, my joy should be continual when I have the miracle. No, 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 you're not in the next part. He says in the next part, don't give up in the time of trouble. He's telling you to keep joy in place in the time of trouble. He's not saying keep joy in place in good times. He's not saying keep joy in place when you receive that miracle. No, no, no. The admonition here is when you're in trouble. When you're in trouble. And I understand we are all humans. I understand. We are not superhuman. We are human. We are only superhuman when we activate the power of God that is in us. That's why it is called the joy of the Lord is our strength. It is not your own joy. It is the joy of the Lord. When you activate it, then the peace of God that transcends all understanding will flood your heart 
and your mind through Christ Jesus. I understand. You get that diagnosis. Fear comes. You receive that letter of termination. Fear comes. You hear that bad news. Fear comes. It's only natural. But you must do something immediately. Fear comes. Don't entertain fear. Don't throw pity party. Calling people up and down and throw pity party. Throw me no, 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 no. Stop it. We are not of those that don't have hope. Bible says that if we are like those that don't have hope in this world, that we are of all men most miserable. What differentiates us from the unbeliever is that we have the glorious hope. Glorious hope. It's because we have a God that has given us beautiful promises. We have a God that stands by and with us in the fire, in the storm. He's right there by our side. The disciples were in the boat in the midst of the storm and they were fearful because for a second, they forgot who was with them in that boat. You cannot be with Jesus in the boat and harm or destruction will befall you. Oh, our problem is that we are not aware of his presence. We're no longer aware that he's with us. Oh, Paul, uh, sorry, Peter had his eye on Christ. And he said to Jesus, bid me come if it is truly you. And Jesus said to him, come, son. And the Bible says that he stepped out from the boat on water and he didn't sink. Hey, and he started walking towards Jesus. But the Bible says that the thunder and lightning struck and the waves rose. Peter took his eye away from Christ and looked at the storm. <laughs> Peter took his eye away from Jesus and listened to the doctor's report. Peter took his eye away from Jesus and looked at that letter of termination. Hey! What happened? He started sinking. The difference between walking on water and sinking is where your eyes is at, is who you are looking at. Who have you set your eyes on? Who have you set your affections on? That is the difference between your miracle and you sinking. Who are you looking at? Are you running around seeking help from where help will not come? Have you fixed your eyes on Jesus? Have you fixed your eyes on that strong tower? The Bible says the name of Jesus is a mighty strong tower. Listen, no matter how massive that tower is, no matter how massive that fortress is, listen to me, if you are outside it, you are exposed to danger. The Bible did not say, those that gather around it shall be saved. The Bible says, only those that run into it shall be saved. When you go chatting about your problem, throwing a pity party about your problem because of fear, do you know what you've done? You are outside that fortress. You are exposed to the elementary spirits outside that fortress. And guess what? You are in danger. You are in danger. We need to understand how spiritual warfare works. Oh, I'll tell this story a thousand times and I won't get tired of telling this story about Jerry Savelle. When they got the evil report from the doctor, they went to their house, unplugged their TV, stopped their newspaper subscription, called their friends and said, hey, we needed some time. We're taking time out. We might not be taking your calls when you call. We, if you knock on our door, we might not answer you. Give us time. There's something we want to do. 
There's something we are believing God for. It's like a retreat. It's like a sabbatical. When we are done, we will let you know. <laughs> then things will return to status quo. But for that moment, where they had a battle, they set their eye as a flint. Held on to God. Disconnected from people that will not help them. Disconnected from bad news. <laughs> Disconnected from anything that will challenge their faith. And they sat on the word. Hey! The word of God. The name of Jesus. Is a strong tower. The rest is history. They got a mind-blowing miracle that defied medicine. Because they kept their eye on God. Kept on eye on their God. Don't give up in the time of trouble. There's something you must do in the time of trouble. There's something you must do when you're expectant. It says commune with God at all times. Stop communing with people that will not help you. Commune with God at all times. The final version I'm going to read this from is the message translation. It says, be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. You see that word expectation? <laughs> be cheerful while you're expecting miracles from God. Be laughing. Fill your heart with joy. Fill your heart with the word of God. Fill your heart with thanks. Be cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. I repeat it again. Don't quit when the going gets tough. Be cheer excuse me, be cheerful in hard times. See, help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. And in this group of scriptures, I believe from verse um, from verse 9 to verse 21, there are some things, there's some conduct as a Christian which must adopt. And I want to give you this list today. I don't know if you're trusting God for something. I want you to start living like this. I want you to start conducting your life like this. And guess what? Miracles, miracles, no the tire Jesus. Miracles will be abundant in your life. From verse 9, he talked about walking in love. Listen carefully. Oh, oh, if only the saints, if only the saints can get this, that your faith will not walk outside love. If only you can get this. The Bible talks about this. I'm going to show you that scripture. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, that faith walketh through love. This is very paramount that we know this. That no matter what you're going through, whenever you're standing in faith and you're trusting God for that miracle, your love life must be top-notch. You have to make sure they are walking in love with everyone around you. You must make sure they are walking in love. Because once you step out of love, you hamper your faith and you shall set you that miracle, that thing you are trusting for. That's why you're in that place in Romans chapter 9. These are the conduct you must put in place whenever you are in trial, whenever bad news has come to you, whenever you are believing God for something, and when things are good, this is the Christian conduct. But more so, when things are bad. Walk in genuine love. You see that in verse 9. Especially if you're reading from the message translation, Romans 12, verse 9. In that same verse 9, it says, run away from evil. This is the time you don't get entangled with evil. That same verse 9 says, do good. Do good. 
This is the time now. Yes, you're going to think. But you must be sensitive during this your trial. So sensitive to those around you that are also struggling. One of the ways to break a hold of hell on your life is to look for someone going through trials. Someone being held by one of the holds of hell and help them break that hold over their life. As you help them break that hold over their life, your own snare will release you. Oh, I don't know how to explain it, but that's how it works. Walk in love, run away from evil, do good. Prefer one another. Put people first. Yes, I'm going to try. I can't say I'm going to try out. It's all about me. No, 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 no. Make it all about somebody else. When you make it all about somebody else, God puts you forward in the queue. You jump the queue because you preferred someone else ahead of you. That is how it works. See that in verse 10, verse 11. Don't be lazy. Walk as God walks behind the scene. What does that mean? Start putting your faith to work. When Jesus told Mary, oh no, it's not my time. It's not yet time to do miracles. She did not say a word to him. Rather, she exercised her faith. She went to the servants. Anything he tells you to do, do it. When the woman with the issue of blood had the miracles of Jesus, she has lost all her living from suffering from this sickness for 12 years. What did she do? She said, hey, I will only touch the hem of his garment. If I can do that, I know for sure I will be healed. And she didn't only talk about it. She stepped out in faith. The Bible said there was a throng following Jesus. In my imagination, she can't push through the throng. She's a woman. She's smelly. She's filthy. If she stands with them, they will smell her and push her away. The only way is to be far away from their noses. I believe she got on all fours and started crawling on all fours to Jesus. She took drastic action. Whenever there is drastic pain, drastic challenge, don't meet it with mellow action. Meet it with drastic action. And that's what she did. Walk as God walks behind the scene. Take action steps of faith and let God do the rest. Be zealous in service, verse 11. Make sure you're serving whatever assignment that has been given you in church. Make sure you keep to it. This is not the time to run away from your assignment. People make this mistake. Oh, I'm not feeling well. Let me take a break from church. <laughs> See, when I'm sick or not feeling well, you don't know it. That is when I preach the more. That is when I am exuberant the more. Why? I know how these things work. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not. They are mighty through God. And one of those weapons is to act as if nothing is wrong with you. Satan cannot understand it. But you should be down. You should be rolled up in the bed. You should be hiding, shaking somewhere. Why are you here jumping and shouting? Hey, that is faith. You act as what you want to become. You don't act as what you are or as what you are feeling. No, 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 no. You act as what you want to become. What you want to see. I want to be whole, healed, healed. What do you do when you're whole and healed? Are you rolling about in bed? No, you're up and about. Start acting like it. That is how the miracle comes. Be zealous in service. Don't drop the ball that God has given you. Don't. 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 Don't drop the ball. Keep the fire of the Spirit burning, verse 11, as you serve. That means keep fervent in the Spirit, no matter what is going on. Don't let the fire of the Spirit be quenched on your inside. Satan wants to put off your fire so his demons can feast on you. You don't allow that. 
In verse 12, don't give up. We've read that. Keep praying. Verse 13, keep giving and helping others. Repay evil with good. This is a time where all the people that have attacked you, all the people that might have done wrong to you, all the people that might have said things against you, this is the time to seek them out <laughs> and show them kindness. This is the time to seek them out <laughs> and give them a gift. This is the time to call them. I say, how are you doing? I'm praying for you. I'm standing with you. Pay evil with good. Pay evil with good. This is spiritual warfare. We think that spiritual warfare is only praying, praying, pray, shaking, praying, shaking, praying, shaking. It is part of it, but it's not only it. Things like this, love, like I keep telling people, is the greatest weapon. There is hope. There is faith. There is love. And the greatest is love. Love is active. Love is not passive. Love is active. Why do we leave the greatest weapon and focus on the least potent weapon? Why don't you take the greatest weapon in your arsenal and defeat and destroy the enemy once and for all? Why are you using a toy gun on a man that has come against you with a missile? Pull out your missile, for God's sake, and end the warfare once and for all. The greatest, the greatest is love. Repair evil with evil. As we go further, you see the love, love action steps. Be happy for others. That is walking in love. Rejoice with others. Even when you've not gotten your miracle. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Even when they're going through pain. You see that, that is in verse 15. Verse 16. Live at peace and unity with others. This is how we walk in love. And it is love that brings the miracle. Be humble and value others. Verse 16. Verse 17. Never hold a grudge. Make this your lifestyle. Someone has said something against you. Don't hold a grudge. Someone has even said something in your face. Don't hold a grudge. Free your mind. Be at peace with everyone. Why? There is something you are believing God for. Don't let the enemy seduce you to step out of the stronghold. Don't let the enemy seduce you to step out of love. Don't. Guard your love life. Never seek revenge. You see that from verse 19 where God says, See, vengeance is my name. That he will repay you. He will repay those that do evil to you. Then be kind. This is how to walk as a Christian. This is how to walk when you're expecting things from God. This is how you walk when there's crisis in your life. Keep love first. And let the potent power of love walk the miracle for you. But I thank you for your word. <laughs> oh, oh, you're listening to me. I command right now, right now, that, that sickness leaves your body in the name of Jesus. Out. I command right now that that money you're looking for for that job, for that contract, to start that business, finds you now in the name of Jesus. Receive it. That pain leaves your body now in the name of Jesus. But I thank you. Oh, oh, there's somebody, you need an open door into a country. I command that door to open up now in the name of Jesus. Where you least expect it. But I worship you. I give you praise. I ask, Lord, that your blessings come upon the ones that have heard your word. Especially those that have made up their mind to start walking in love. Start walking in love. Let their miracles be accelerated. May their expectation never be cut off. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Keep it there with me on Tuesday. It's going to be awesome this Tuesday. Remember, 
We are starting this new series, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. I was in a training throughout this weekend, and um, some of the truths, <laughs> I didn't even have those on my list, that are not rightly divided, we are shared. And they are also shared, not rightly divided. And I was noting them down. Just this weekend, I got four new topics <laughs> to handle. Let's see how it goes on Tuesday. I might start with them because they are short, 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 you know, topics. I might, I might even handle two or three at once this Tuesday. And why it is important to rightly divide the scripture is that when we don't rightly divide the scripture, it affects your faith. Because you believe that this must happen, whereas it shouldn't happen, you don't exercise your faith when those things happen. Because you believe it should be there. So at the end of the day, we are destroyed by ourselves. That's the truth. Oh Israel, only you can destroy yourself. That is why having the rightly divided scripture builds of faith in you. If what you are hearing does not build of faith in you, listen carefully. Query that scripture. Because the word of God is the word of faith. Anything you hear that affects and challenges your faith negatively, always query it. Always. Always. It should build up faith in you. It should build up faith in you. So join me this Tuesday. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. I'm excited about this. And with that, we're going to walk into, into Easter. It's going to be awesome. Don't miss Easter service, Sunday Easter service. I'm going to be here. It's going to be great and awesome. So see you on Tuesday. Go succeed. Go prosper. For God is with you. Bye-bye. Ooh. <laughs>